This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to take a closer look at the author of Trump's speech at the United Nations on Tuesday. White House senior adviser Stephen Miller, architect of widely condemned immigration policies such as family separation. Miller also pushed for the recent decision to significantly cut the number of refugees the United States will accept, as well as a proposal that will make it harder for immigrants to become citizens or get green cards if they have ever used a range of public benefit programs, including Obamacare, children's health insurance and food stamps. This is part of Trump's address that Miller wrote. Illegal immigration exploits vulnerable populations, hurts hardworking citizens, and has produced a vicious cycle of crime, violence and poverty. Well, Trump's anti-immigrant rhetoric and policies, many handcrafted by Stephen Miller, are leading some in Miller's own family to speak out against Stephen Miller. This includes Dr. David Glosser, Miller's uncle, who recently wrote a piece for Politico magazine headlined, Stephen Miller is an immigration hypocrite, I know because I'm his uncle. In it, he wrote, if my nephew's ideas on immigration had been in force a century ago, our family would have been wiped out. For more, we go to Philadelphia to speak with Dr. Glosser, a retired neuropsychologist and former faculty member at Boston University School of Medicine and Jefferson Medical College, now works as a volunteer with refugees in Philadelphia. Dr. Glosser, welcome to Democracy Now! Um, talk about Stephen Miller. Talk about your family and why um, and, and Stephen Miller's policies. Well, I'd be happy to talk about it. The, uh, as, you've, as you've alluded to, I made an, wrote an article for uh, Politico about a month or so ago in response to what I regarded as intolerable policies in the United States government uh, towards the treatment of refugees. The, uh, it was a decision I made, not lightly, uh, in light of the family connection. Please excuse my voice. I've been a bit under the weather lately, so I'll do the best I can. So I made the, uh, the decision to write this article uh, for, two main, for two main reasons. One was to make it clear that, uh, that our family uh, stood for the rights of asylum seekers and refugees, and also because the policies which are being advanced by the Trump administration uh, in terms of refugees, in terms of the management and the treatment of refugees, represent a significant danger to American citizens as well, since it entails a serious attack on democracy. We see here now that, if, that American law and policy are being, uh, being officially made on the basis of race, or religion, national origin, ethnicity. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a great danger to, uh, great danger to American citizens as well as to the refugees. If today, it becomes normalized in political discussion to be able to make laws and regulations on the basis of this nature, then it exposes all of us to danger of being targeted next. If today it's them, today it could be you, it could be me, it could be anybody. And Dr. Glosser, have you had occasion to discuss with your your nephew some of these policies at all? At all, and and uh, is your sense of his direct involvement uh, in shaping them? As I've made clear with other interviews and uh, with my publications, I've only met Stephen Miller perhaps 10 times throughout his childhood, and the last time I had a meaningful discussion with him was probably five years ago. So I don't have any inside insight into, uh, into, into this, nor has he specifically discussed any, anything of this nature with me. What I know about Stephen's uh, positions on immigration, migration, and other policies are entirely from his public persona. Can you talk about your own family and what would have happened to your family if the immigration policies that Stephen Miller is pushing for were in place when they came to this country? Well, that's a pretty simple question to answer, and one that is not uncommon. The, uh, my family originated, at least as far as we can trace, uh, from an area of the former Russian Empire, which is now in the country of uh, Belarus. We, uh, our family, my great-grandfather and his family, we believe, had been there for a couple of hundred years uh, until the early 1900s. 
Uh, my great grandfather uh, was uh, and his family were dirt poor, lived in a lived in a hovel in a in a uh, tiny townlet of Antipol. Barely subside, they're basically subsistence farmers and traders. Uh, lots of children, some of whom survived into adulthood, some of whom did not. Uh, in the early 19, late 1800s, early 1900s, the Tsarist uh, regime made it a point of public policy to to ramp up persecution of Jewish of Jewish people living in what was called the Pale of Settlement. This took the form of, a, of organized attacks. Uh, by, uh, by state-sponsored uh, uh, troops, uh, the Cossacks and so forth, as well as, as, well as encouraged and unpunished uh, attacks by, um, uh, by gangs and so forth, and, and uh, other rabble-rousers. So the atmosphere of anti-Semitism was extremely strong. My grandfather, Sam, in fact, as a child, lost an eye in one of these attacks. Not too long thereafter, my great-grandfather, his name was Wolf, um, made the decision that there was no real viable future for them in that part of the world. And so in 1903, he took passage, uh, he scraped up enough money to take passage on a ship to the United States, where he followed his older brother. Uh, he and his older brother did sweatshop work and peddling fruit on street corners in New York City until they were able to raise enough money to bring over the balance of the, of the, uh, of the immediate family. Uh, that happened in 1906. The family prospered. We settled in western Pennsylvania in my hometown of Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which was a burgeoning iron and steel center at the time. And we developed a, we, we developed a business, which ultimately was listed on the American Stock Exchange, and which, uh, which hired thousands of people over the years. And, and Dr. Glasser, uh, what kind of uh, immigration restrictions existed at the time when your family came, in terms uh, as as uh, refugees uh, fleeing th those conditions uh, in their home country? Well, the United States essentially had no serious immigration laws at all until roughly 1882, when the Chinese Exclusion Act was put into place. And at that time, as now, uh, immigration policy in the United States was determined. Uh, to a great extent, upon uh, on labor needs and on, uh, on racial preferences. After the Chinese Exclusion Act, the next major immigration law had to do uh, was started in was in 1924. The American firsters of the day, uh, who described themselves in that way, were were, uh, were essentially had adopted a, a nativist position, saying that the only real Americans were those that were already there. White Americans, and they wanted to also, they wanted to uh, to reduce the number of immigrants coming in entirely, and they wanted to, re they wanted to bar immigrants from just certain regions and from certain countries. So in uh, so in 1924, the the Exclusion Act of that of that, of those years, essentially barred Catholics uh, from Southern Europe and from Ireland and uh, Jews from the Russian Empire. Accordingly. The 74 members of our family that had decided earlier not to come to the United States or were unable to go, when war broke out in, uh, in Europe uh, in, in the late 1930s, they were unable to come to the United States. We couldn't bring them over. And uh, in our family, there were 74 members of the, that we could trace. Uh, none of them survived the war. They were all wiped out, murdered, exterminated. Uh, the, there had been 5,000 Jews in the town of Antipol at its height. Uh, before World—at the start of World War II, there were 2,000. After the war, there were 74 who survived. So it's not a theoretical question, what would have happened to the family? It's a real question about what did happen to the family. And the answer is, they were all murdered. They had no place to go. Nobody would take them. Mm. I was wondering your reaction, Dr. Glosser, when Stephen Miller's childhood rabbi, Rabbi Neil Kamas Daniels of Beth Shir Shalom, denounced Miller during his Rosh Hashanah sermon uh, earlier this month, calling Stephen Miller a purveyor of negativity, violence, malice and brutality. He said, quote, Mr. Miller, you've set back the Jewish contribution to making the world spiritually whole through your arbitrary division of these desperate people. The actions that you now encourage President Trump to take make it obvious to me that you didn't get my or our Jewish message, addressing him by name. Your thoughts about what he's saying about your sister's yeah. son? 
I'm not an extremely religiously observant person, but I take seriously the admonitions uh, which, uh, which our faith has given us to protect the refugee and welcome the, sta the stranger. So I, I find myself not in disagreement with, uh, with Stephen Miller's rabbi. It's, um, the United States is a great country, a large country, a wealthy country. We have wonderful expertise in absorbing refugees and immigrants. The United States also has treaty obligations and laws which, which uh, enable us and regulate the management of refugee applications in the United States. The current administration is doing everything it can in order to reduce the total number of immigrants, be they legal or illegal. And I think they do it for, frankly, demographic political reasons. Most demographers think that by, the, by 2045, that, uh, that people of predominantly European origin, white European origin, are no longer going to be a majority in the United States. They'll remain a plurality, but not a majority. And it's a demonstrated fact that people of uh, the, the non-white people are less likely to vote Republican. Accordingly, I think this fits in very well with this is one of the reasons I think why the Republican Party, which had once been the party of family values and the moral majority, are willing to tolerate Trumpism, which uh, bases itself in Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if you could talk about some of the volunteer work that you've been doing, and, and also uh, you've worked with some uh, refugees, uh, specifically uh, one from yeah. Eritrea that you've talked about in the past. Since my retirement, I decided to uh, act as a volunteer in these issues. I felt that the, the immigration issue was very important, and my own family was helped by one of these volunteer organizations, something called HIAS. Which, uh, which my, um, my great-grandfather uh, was the first beneficiary in his will, in fact. So I volunteered uh, with Hyas as a, a neuropsychologist. Um, people who are coming to the United States who make legal application for asylum are called asylees. They're able to, any way that they come to the country, be they at a border legally or whether they just infiltrate the country illegally, people who report and ask for asylum are, according to American law, are allowed to do so. And must have a hearing. Part of what they have to do, according to U.S. law and U.N. and the United States is also signatory to U.N. Uh, commission rules and treaties. Part of what they, according to our laws, part of what they have to do is they have to demonstrate that they have a reasonable fear of persecution if they remain in or return to their country, persecution or danger. Now, people like uh, the, the gentleman in my story, Joseph, who was. Uh, who was uh, grossly tortured and mistreated as a child soldier, as a child conscript in his home country of Eritrea, and managed to escape with his life. Upon his exit from Eritrea, they don't provide him with a, with a certificate documenting that he'd been the victim of torture and persecution. So when he gets to the United States after his 10-year uh, journey, he's got to make the case that he has a good reason to, uh, to be afraid of going back to Eritrea. Accordingly, uh, he, there are voluntary agencies, such as the ones that I've been volunteering for, who have attorneys, doctors, nurses, psychologists, social workers, and so forth, who help these people to make their to, uh, to establish whether or not they have a reasonable fear of return. So physicians and psychologists, and in my case, neuropsychologists, uh, will listen to the story and see if there's evidence that people have suffered persecution, torture, and the like both for the physical and as well as the, as the, the, the biological, as well as the mental scars you, that may arise. Do you see your work as a kind of atonement for your nephew, Stephen Miller? No, not at all. I, it's, uh, I, don't have any, I don't have any obligation to atone for anybody else's, uh, for anybody else's sins. Uh, uh, to the extent, that, uh, the, the extent that I enact atonement, it would be for my own faults. Did, did many I see of this as part of— my, I did, see it as part of my duty as an ethical human being and as an American citizen. Did many of your family members agree with you? Did people in your family want you to come forward? It's an interesting question. Uh, prior to this, I had, uh, I had been writing and speaking on the subject to some degree, but various members of my family implored me to seek a wider audience so that our name not be associated uh, with these policies. After, uh, after the political article, came out, I received no less than 100 phone calls, letters, emails, public social media comments and so forth from family members, both close members and those I don't even know, thanking me for the peace. 
The other interesting part of this is that after this story went more or less viral on the web, I li received literally thousands of contacts uh, uh, through social media, through email and telephone and, and postal mail from people thanking me for having written it, because every so many people have a story just like ours and just like that of other immigrants trying to come into the country to escape persecution. The thing that really surprised me was I had expected a flood of trolls and uh, negative comments and death threats and the like. As a matter of fact, there were only four or five people who were frank uh, white supremacists and uh, frank admitted Nazis and KKKers and, and uh, white supremacist types who trolled me. Which, uh, other than that, though, out of the many hundreds and thousands of people, it was a tremendous wave of support. Mm. I think people are looking for some sort of a mental, of a, how should we say, a, a moral clarity on the subject so that they not be associated with acts like the imprisonment of these 2,500 or 3,000 children mm. at our borders. Well, Dr. Glosser, we want to thank you so much for being with us. Dr. David Glosser is uncle of Stephen Miller, the senior aide well known for his anti immigrant views to President Trump, who, among other things, uh, it's believed crafted uh, Trump's UN speech yesterday. Dr. Glosser, retired neuropsychologist, former faculty member at Boston University School of Medicine and Jefferson Medical College. We'll link to your piece at Politico with the headline um, Stephen Miller. Uh, is an immigration hypocrite, I know, because I'm his uncle. Uh, Dr. Glosser works with refugees now in Philadelphia.